Welcome to The Dep Dive. Today, we're digging into a really fascinating, maybe even bewildering company, AST Space Mobile, tickers ASTS. Right. And this one came straight from you, our listeners. You asked for it because, frankly, the valuation seems, well, completely detached from reality on paper. We need to figure out what the market is actually seeing here. That's exactly the core issue, isn't it? You've yeah. got a company with, let's be honest, almost no revenue right now, but it's promising something huge connecting the entire planet directly to your standard phone. It's world-changing stuff if they pull it off. If they pull it off, that's the multi-billion dollar question. Precisely, because the conflict is just massive. You have this incredible blue sky potential versus um, just profound speculative risk. Mm -hmm. And when you try to model it out financially, the range is just wild. Our analysis shows anything from a bearish, say, $40 per share intrinsic value, okay. all the way up to a super bullish case over $200 a share. Wow. And the current price as of today, October 17th, 2025. Trading around $81.48. So right in the middle of that huge uncertainty. Okay. So our mission today, get past the hype, look at the data, and really give you a solid assessment of why this valuation gap exists. What odds is the market actually pricing in? Let's dive in. All right. Part one, the core foundation. Let's start with chapter one, business understanding. What exactly is ASTS trying to do here? Because it's not just another cell company. No, not at all. Their core idea is actually pretty clever in how it tries to manage risk. They're positioning themselves as an infrastructure provider. Think of it like building the space-based cell towers, but not selling the phone plans. Okay, so they partner with existing phone companies. Exactly. It's what the analysts are calling a B2B2C model mm -hmm. or even a super wholesale model. ASTS provides the network from space, and then they partner with the mobile network operators, the MNOs, mm -hmm. you know, the AT&Ts, Vodafones, Verizons of the world. Right. Those MNOs already have the customers, the billing systems, the local licenses. ASTS just provides the connection in places those MNOs can't reach terrestrially. And the deal structure is pretty straightforward, a 50-50 revenue split. And this is where it gets interesting because the scale they unlock through these partnerships is just massive. It really is. They've already signed agreements with over 50 MNOs globally. We're talking Giants, AT&T, mm -hmm. Verizon, Vodafone, Rakuten in Japan. That's huge. Yeah. And together, those partners give ASTS access to, get this, a potential subscriber base of over 3 billion people. Wow. So they completely bypass the incredibly expensive step of acquiring retail customers. That's the strategic advantage right there. But uh, none of that matters if the technology doesn't work. Okay, let's talk tech. What's the core service? The core service is the space mobile network itself. It's designed to be the first space-based cellular broadband network that connects directly to standard, totally a modified 4G and 5G smartphones anywhere on Earth. Standard phones, no special dish, no satellite phone needed. That's the key differentiator. Absolutely. And they've shown proof of concept. Their prototype satellite, Blue Walker 3, launched back in 2022. It successfully connected to phones on the ground, achieved speeds up to, I think it was 21 megabits per second. Okay, so proof it can work. But the real bet is on the next generation, right? The Bluebird satellites. Yes. Yeah. These are the production models. They're supposed to have these enormous phased array antennas over 2,000 square feet, apparently. Huge. Aiming for speeds up to 120 mil APs. The whole value proposition hangs on these working at scale. It's about eliminating those connectivity gaps. You know, the fact that 90% of the Earth's surface has no cell signal. Think emergency comms, bridging the digital divide. Big potential market. But what about competition? Who else is trying to do this? Well, you have the established satellite players like Iridium, Global Star, but they require specialized hardware. You need their specific sat phone or device. Right. So not direct competition for the standard phone market. Exactly. The big direct threat everyone watches is SpaceX's Starlink. They're also working on direct to sell capabilities. And Starlink has, you know, a massive advantage with their own rockets for launch control and existing infrastructure. That's a huge cost and logistics benefit for them. So what's ASTS's moat against Starlink and others? It comes down to a few things. First, the sheer capital required is a massive barrier, billions of dollars. Second, ASTS has built up a really significant IP portfolio. We're talking over 3,300 patent claims related to their technology. That's intended to protect their specific approach. Okay, interesting. Let's shift gears then. Chapter two, management evaluation. Who's running this show? It's founder-led. Abel Avellan is the CEO. He's got over 25 years in the space communications industry. And importantly, he had a prior successful exit, sold his last company for around $550 million. Okay, so he's got credibility, track record. 
definitely gives investors some confidence. But leadership isn't just about vision. It's about execution. And that's where we see some potential issues. Even the lawsuit. Yeah, the 2024 class action lawsuit. It was related to production delays, blaming supplier issues. The market reaction was brutal. Stock dropped almost 24% on that news. It really highlighted the execution risk here. Building this stuff is complex, and scaling manufacturing is clearly a challenge for them. And how are they managing capital? Their strategy seems pretty focused. Extremely focused. It's all about deployment. Capital expenditures are ramping up fast hit $323 million in 2025. They're pouring every dollar into getting those bluebirds built and launched. And they made that acquisition recently, right? Eliasat. Yes, that was a really shrewd move, actually. Eliasat LTD. They acquired them in September 2025. Why? To get their hands on crucial S-band ITU priority spectrum rights. Okay, translate that. Why is S-band spectrum important? So spectrum is like the radio highway for wireless signals. S-band is a specific frequency range that's really good for mobile satellite services globally. Getting priority rights in the ITU, the international regulator, is like getting the HOV lane on that highway. It's incredibly valuable and hard to get. And crucially, they paid for Eliosat entirely with ASTS stock. Leveraging their high stock price. Smart. Very. But let's look at the financial picture through that management lens. If you look at return on invested capital, ROIC, it's terrible. Deeply negative. So they come where between minus 15% and minus 51%. Which sounds awful, but you kind of expect that at this stage, right? <laughs> you absolutely do. It's what some call the value destruction phase. You have to spend massively to build the infrastructure before you can generate returns. The entire investment thesis relies on the future profitability being so enormous that it justifies all this upfront negative return. It definitely explains the polarization around the company. You mentioned that short seller report from 2022. Right. The one calling it a wildly risky science project. Yeah. It just highlights how divided the view is on management's credibility and the project's feasibility. Okay. Let's tackle those financials head on. Chapter three, financial analysis. This is where things get uh, strange. Strange is one word for it. You've got a market cap currently bouncing around, let's say, $32.35 billion. Sometimes higher. It's volatile. $32 billion. And the revenue, trailing 12 months. A mere $4.89 million. Right. So the market values the company at roughly 6,600 times its current annual sales. Exactly. The disconnect is just staggering. It tells you immediately that the entire valuation is based on future expectations. Those analyst forecasts projecting growth to, what was it, $2.54 billion by 2028? They have to happen for this price to make any sense. But surprisingly, their short-term financial health, like liquidity, looks okay. It does, and that's crucial. Thanks to recent capital raises, their current ratio is actually really strong, over eight. That means they have plenty of short-term assets to cover short-term liabilities, give them breathing room, and debt to equity is manageable too, around 0.42. But that breathing room is getting used up fast by the cash burn. Oh, absolutely. The cash burn is relentless and, importantly, accelerating as deployment ramps up. TTM free cash flow is negative to the tune of, say, $483 million to nearly $680 million, depending on the period. Net margin is, well, meaningless, but astronomically negative, like minus 7,000% or something absurd. So standard valuation metrics are useless. PE is negative. Price to sales is stratospheric. Completely useless. The only tool you can even attempt to use is a discounted cash flow, or DCF, model. But because all the inputs are speculative future projections, the output is, well, we saw the range. Right, back to the $40 bear case and the $200 bull case. And that enormous range just underscores the sensitivity. The valuation hinges almost entirely on two things. Hitting that massive $2.5 billion revenue target by 2028 and what discount rate you use. Explain the discount rate sensitivity quickly. The discount rate, or WACC weighted average cost of capital, reflects the riskiness of the investment. For a super risky venture like ASTS, analysts might use a very high discount rate, maybe 20 25%. That drastically reduces the present value of future cash flows. A bull might use a lower rate, maybe closer to 7 10%, assuming success. Small changes in that rate have a huge impact on the final DCF value. Got it. Okay, let's take a quick pause here. Just a reminder, this deep dive comes from the research team at Stock Analytics AI. For just 4.99 euros a month, you get access to our full library that's 500 deep dive videos covering every single stock in the S&P 500. And coming up next, exclusively for members, we're tackling the Nasdaq 100. Plus, members can request specific stock deep dives. If there's a ticker you want us to break down like this, just drop it in the comment section and we'll get on it. Okay, we're back. Part two, market dynamics and risk. Let's start with chapter four market sentiment. 
What's the feeling out there about ASTS? Well, th there's a fascinating disconnect. On one hand, you have the professional analysts. Their average 12-month price target is way below where the stock is trading now, somewhere between, say, $45 and $54. Implying like 40-50% downside from the current $81 price. Exactly. The consensus rating is just a hold. So Wall Street professionals seem pretty cautious, even skeptical, at this price level. But the market itself, the price action, tells a different story. Completely different. The stock has been on a tear, especially after that Verizon partnership announcement in early October. That was seen as huge validation. Right, a major m and signing on. Yeah. And technically, the stock chart shows a strong, sustained uptrend. It's trading significantly above its 50-day moving average, which is maybe around $52, $54, and way above its 200-day, which is down near $36, $42. The momentum is clearly positive, ignoring the analysts for now. Which makes it a classic battleground stock, doesn't it? Oh, absolutely. And you see that clearly in the short interest figures. It's exceptionally high, ranging from around 16.7% up to nearly 19% of the publicly available shares, the float. How does that compare to similar companies? Much higher. Peers might be around 5% short interest. This indicates a very large number of investors are betting against the stock. But that also creates potential fuel for a rally. Exactly. That's the short squeeze potential. <laughs> the days to cover ratio. Basically, how many days of average trading volume it would take for all the shorts to buy back their shares is somewhere between three and six days. If good news hits and forces those shorts to cover, their buying can itself drive the price up dramatically and quickly. Interesting dynamic. Okay, let's look inside the company. Chapter 5, Ownership Structure. Who actually owns ASTS shares? Institutions hold a significant chunk, somewhere between, say, 44% and 61% of the shares. And importantly, who are these institutions? That's the key. A big part of that institutional ownership is actually their strategic partners. Rakuten holds over 11%. Vodafone has 6%. AT&T has almost 3%. These aren't just financial investors. They're companies with a vested interest in ASTS succeeding. That definitely adds a layer of confidence. And what about insiders? Well, the founder aligned that is incredibly strong. CEO Abel Avellan still holds a massive 23% stake in the company. That's huge. He's got serious skin in the game. Billions of dollars worth at the current price. Right. Now, you do see some net insider selling from other executives, but often that's through pre-scheduled 10B51 plans, which are typically for diversification. It doesn't necessarily signal a lack of confidence like the founder selling would. Avellan holding tight is the big signal here. Okay, let's bring it all together now. Chapter 6, Risk Assessment. We've looked at the business, the tech, the finances, the market. What are the biggest risks and, I guess, the core strengths? Like a SWOT analysis summary. Okay, top strength. Definitely that patent portfolio, the 3,300 plus claims. That IP combined with the MNO partnership network, giving access to those 3 billion potential users, that's their core advantage. And the biggest weakness. It has to be the lack of any commercial revenue right now, mm -hmm. coupled with that very real execution and manufacturing risk. We saw the lawsuit delays are costly and damaging. Can they actually build and launch these complex satellites reliably and on schedule? That's the weak point. External threats. We mentioned Starlink. Starlink remains the biggest competitive threat, absolutely. Their vertical integration is a powerful advantage. But there are other external factors adding pressure now, too. Like the macro environment. Yes. Two big ones recently. First, those new 2025 U.S. tariffs on high-tech components coming from Asia. Yeah. That could directly increase ASTS's hardware costs by, say, 12% to 18% and potentially cause more supply chain headaches and delays. Okay, hitting them right where they're vulnerable, manufacturing costs and timelines. Exactly. And second, the broader issue of high interest rates. Mm -hmm. We touched on this with the discount rate. Higher rates make borrowing more expensive, but more importantly for ASTS, they increase the discount rate investors use to value those far off future profits. That directly pushes down the calculated intrinsic value. Yeah. So tariffs increase costs, high interest rates decrease the present value of future income. It's a tough macro environment for a company like this. A perfect storm of pressures on a pre-revenue company. Okay, let's wrap this up. Chapter 7, Conclusion. Time to synthesize the bull and bear cases. All right, the bull case. You're betting on a pioneer with a strong IP moat, unique strategic access to billions of customers through m and partnerships, led by a proven founder who is massively invested alongside you. First mover advantage and direct-to-standard handset satellite comes. And the bear case. The bear case. You're looking at an extreme, maybe even a rational valuation, $32 billion market cap on $5 million revenue. There's severe execution risk, already demonstrated by delays in that lawsuit. And you face massive, well-funded competition from SpaceX's Starlink, 
which has key structural advantages. Plus, macro headwinds like tariffs and interest rates are working against them. Which brings us back to that valuation range. Right, that incredibly wide DCF range of $40 to $200 per share just says it all. It reflects the massive uncertainty. So the final assessment, where does that leave an investor looking at the current price of around $81? At $81.48, the market is clearly pricing in a significant probability of success. It's betting that they will overcome the hurdles and deploy the network. However, it doesn't seem to be pricing in like total global domination or unmitigated success, just yet there's still upside left if they truly capture the entire blue sky scenario reflected in that $200 plus valuation. So it's a bet on execution, fundamentally. Fundamentally. The takeaway for you, the listener, has to be this. An investment in ASTS today is not like buying Apple or Microsoft. It is essentially a venture capital style investment made in the public markets. The outcome is likely binary. You could see substantial returns if they succeed, or you could lose most, if not all, of your capital if they fail. High risk, potentially high reward. That really clarifies the stakes. Okay, before we sign off, here's a final thought for you to chew on, building on what we discussed. We talked about ASTS relying on spectrum rights licensed from MNOs in dozens of different countries. That sounds incredibly complex politically and regulatorily. How does that compare to Starlink's strategy? They seem to be aiming for a more integrated, vertically controlled approach where they handle more of the regulatory burden directly with countries. Could that become a major advantage for Starlink, especially if international regulations get even tougher or more fragmented? Something to think about. Definitely a key strategic difference to watch. All right, that's all the time we have for this deep dive. Don't forget to like and subscribe to Stock Analytics AI. And remember, this analysis was generated by an AI system. It's for educational purposes only and should absolutely not be taken as financial advice. Always do your own homework or talk to a qualified financial advisor before making any investment decisions.